Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Researching and Writing a Senior Seminar paper panel. This is part of an ongoing series in the Skill Builders Workshops, which happened throughout the semester. And in today's session, you're going to hear from five students that completed a senior seminar during the fall 2020 semester. And each student will share their experiences and tips for a successful senior seminar. I, my name is Christopher Bishop. Uh, my co-host is Casey Long. We're both librarians here at Agnes, and we work closely with uh, students that are doing senior seminars. And we will act as moderators, but for the most part, students will be sharing their experiences. So we'll just try to facilitate. Um, I guess a few housekeeping things, as Casey mentioned, we'll be recording. So you may wanna mute your video if you'd uh, like to not appear on the screen. And before we get started with introductions and uh, the panel discussion, are there any questions that anyone might have? Sounds like no. So Casey, are you ready to begin? Yes, I am. So hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to be uh, asking our student panelists, our five fantastic uh, Center for Writing and Speaking student panelists, plus our lovely Lydia Cash, um, to introduce themselves. And so can we start with Caitlin Mills, please? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Caitlin. I use she, her, hers pronouns. My major is history. And should I like describe my project or? Are we yes, that? that would be great. Okay. Please describe your project. Yeah. So my senior seminar project um, is based in the 19th century. And I examined the rise of universal education for African-Americans in Georgia. I used Ware High School as a case study. And Ware High School was the first public high school for African-Americans in the state of Georgia. And it was located in Augusta, just two streets away from where I attended high school. So I looked at the rise and fall of the school and kind of talked about the, the rise of universal education and kind of looked at the ideological underpinnings of Georgia's public school system. And it's not so hidden connections to financial decision-making and resource allocation. I think that kind of covers most of it anyway. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. Now I wanna introduce uh, three of our panelists who were in the IR senior seminar, International Relations Senior Seminar last semester. So uh, Leah, Aaron, and Gwen, if you can introduce yourselves in that order and talk about your presentation uh, topic. Sure, thank you, Casey. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Trotman. I am a senior at Agnes Scott. Um, I am major public health minor, um, which is a kind of crazy to say now. Um, in short, my senior thesis was on, in general, answering this question, to what extent um, are public health-based solutions much more effective at um, reducing gun violence in the Caribbean than punitive-based structures? So I like to kind of best describe my senior thesis in two parts. The first half of my senior thesis examined gun violence in the Caribbean through an IR theory known as protracted social conflict theory, PCF, PSC for short. And essentially that theory um, kind of identified what internal and external factors kind of drive gun violence in the Caribbean. And then from there, I focused specifically in the second half of my thesis on those internal factors, which were poverty, unemployment, and the lack of education, um, and talked about how public health as a discipline can be the field to focus, target, address those factors, and then therefore eventually um, reduce gun violence in the region. Fantastic. Erin, you wanna to talk to us about your paper? Yeah, um, so I am a senior, uh, international relations and women's gender and sexuality studies double major. Uh, and in my project, I explored the theoretical and practical potential of transing the field of international relations. And I did this by incorporating the theoretical tenets of trans studies into a constructivist international relations approach um, and developed a new framework within the field. Uh, and then I then applied this to several current events, most notably the uh, practice of exporting US criminal justice models abroad, um, particularly the countries in Latin and South America, um, in order to demonstrate the framework's utility. Um, ultimately, ultimately, my goal was to produce a liberatory political orientation to the um, field of international relations because it kind of lacks that. So. Fantastic. And Gwen, tell us about yours. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gwen. I am another IR major, but apparently I'm slacking a little because I'm not double majoring in anything. I don't even have a minor. I'm just an IR doing my thing. Um, and so my senior seminar 
um, was hoping to address the question of how can environmental action be anti-colonial? Um, and I kind of broke mine down into two parts as well. So the first part was creating a new theoretical framework because I didn't think that anything existed currently could answer that question adequately. Um, and then the second part of that was like Aaron doing a case study where I chose one particular environmental movement in Kenya called the Green Belt Movement. And I used this new theoretical theory or theoretical framework to apply that to the movement to see how was it anti-colonial and how can those things be, those strategies be used in other places. Great. And finally, Lydia, do you, can you tell us about your religious senior, religious studies senior seminar paper? So introduce yourself, tell us about you and tell us about your paper. Yes, for sure. My name is Lydia Cash. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I am actually also double major in religious studies and international relations. So um, I'm working on my second thesis right now. So this is nice. I'll be, I'll get some advice as well. For um, my religious studies thesis, I discuss stories that center gay Christians as well as other LGBTQ plus Christians who experienced conversion therapy and later undid that harmful experience through finding a different perspective of their own faith. Um, I examined the wide breadth of Christian theoethics in regards to the born again gay experience, a term that I coined for the paper. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for being here. And we're going to get started with our questions. So um, to start with, how did you come up with your topic? Um, and who wants to start? Do you want to start, um, Leah? Well, I will summarize this quite quickly. Um, so if you don't know, I was born and raised in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So I'm originally from the Caribbean um, and 21 years old to this day. But I feel like the issue of gun violence has been so prevalent from since I was born. Um, and when I returned back home in March um, because of the virus, um, I had attended between March to October, November, three gun violence related protests. Um, and after each and every single one of the protests, you would get the same senators who would, you know, pop up on the stand and say, hey, change has to get done. Community should get involved. And I would go, yeah, that sounds, sounds pretty good. And then the senators would say it. And then I would look around and I'm like, oh, nothing has kind of happened. Um, and that's kind of the same rhetoric that we've heard after each and every gun violence protest that has, you know, been pervasive in my life for the past 21 years. And so this time around, I thought, well, let me just spend my entire IR semester kind of focusing on ways to kind of reduce gun violence using public health approaches, because that is kind of the community foundation that, you know, the senators were kind of expecting um, and wanting to happen. And so I thought, okay, well, let me kind of focus on public health, look at it through, well, look at gun violence through public health and perhaps kind of offer or gather some information that could potentially be sent to them later on. Um, so that's kind of where my personal kind of connection came from, you know, it's born and where, you know, where it's born and raised, it's an issue that's been super pervasive for a very long time. And so I kind of wanted to spend my semester figuring out how we could tackle it. That's fantastic. So it was a personal connection for you of something that you just wanted to work on. You hadn't worked on it in previous semesters. No, no, I'm a big natural disaster resilience gal building health resilience. So this was something still within public health, but was just an interest of mine that kind of blossomed since I've been back home. So I wanted to kind of focus my semester on that. And now I'm actually focusing in my public health senior capstone on my natural disaster stuff. So, yeah. So had you started it right in the fall or did you have this idea before the fall? Yeah, I definitely remember sitting in like October, November on like the side bench next to or inside Emancipation Garden, which is where the protests kind of were happening. And I remember thinking to myself, this is what I'm gonna do my senior sum on. So it definitely was a couple months before the time came. Well, actually July and then before August came, yeah. That's cool. All right, um, Aaron, do you wanna tell us a little bit about yours? Um, how did you come to this topic? Is it something you worked on previously? Yeah, so um, I am a gender stud studies double major. So of course I was really hoping that I would be able to integrate both of my academic interests into this project. Um, women's studies does not currently have a senior sim in the traditional uh, way. So I really was hoping I'd be able to integrate that into my IR thesis. So that was a big part of it. Um, but I have, I've been working on um, carceral studies projects for a long time. One of the primary current events that I um, analyzed, which I noted was the exportation of criminal punishment models abroad, 
Um, so I knew that I wanted to look at that case study. Um, and I was just really frustrated because nothing within IR was highlighting what I wanted to focus on. And I didn't feel like it was getting me um, to a place that frankly aligned with like my politics and my ethics on that practice. So um, that was kind of how I got into the more theoretical bent of building this framework to analyze this event because I realized that there wasn't that route within traditional IR. Um, so mostly the way that I kind of arrived at this topic was following what I knew that I cared about and I knew that I was good at and not being afraid to draw from interdisciplinary sources. You had a good grounding already, plus um, you'd been doing work in the area so that uh, really helped you feel comfortable tackling it. Is it. Did you feel like you had your topic in hand and f fully fleshed out by the time that you started uh, at the beginning of the semester? Um, so the way that I guess I kind of had my topic was I found a dissertation uh, that had been published by someone um, graduating from um, a PhD, a, obviously a, a doctoral program. Um, and this person was um, Allegra McLeod, also a women's college graduate who had written her entire dissertation on the exportation of criminal justice models. And I read like all 95 pages in like three hours. And I just, I was like, oh yes, this is it. And I think I found that in like late July, early August before the semester, so like right before the semester started. Um, and I was just like, oh, I know I want to do something about this. I know I want to expand on her work. This is really cool. How can I bring my academic background to bear on this work that she's done? That's fantastic. So I'm going to move on to Gwen. Gwen, I know that you um, came with an idea that you were building on. Can you tell us more about your process of coming up with a topic? Yeah, so every IR major is sort of the last class that you take within your core major before senior sem is Paul 326. And at the end of that, you have a pretty chunky research paper that you do. Um, and so when I was kind of thinking about, or actually at the end of that, that semester, my professor said, oh, you know, this would be a good thing to expand upon for senior seminar. Um, and so when I got to senior seminar, I was like, well, I enjoyed writing that. Um, so I'm just going to expand on it, which turned out to be trickier than I thought it was. I felt like I had sort of a false sense of security because everyone else was like, I don't know what I'm writing about. And I was like, well, I already know. That's cool. Um, but it, it's, it's weird how much, how little you know about the things that you think you do. Um, and also reworking a 12 page research paper into a senior seminar is hard. Um, so it's great to have that sense of comfort coming into it, but if you do choose to do that, don't don't think you're too safe because it was really difficult trying to rework your own ideas, not just creating new ones um, that you'd already written down and thought you had a grasp on, but it turns out you didn't really, and you have to make them more complex and more thought out. So, yeah. Right. So um, thank you very much. Uh, Lydia, can you tell us about religious studies. We've heard three people talk about international relations in their senior seminar. What's it, um, how did you come up with a topic for your religious studies one? And um, was there any preliminary work that you did before the semester even started? Yeah, um, so I actually, the like base inspiration, I do of course have a personal connection to LGBTQ issues within the church. Um, but I wasn't quite sure how that would manifest as a paper or if I wanted to pursue something like that in a paper until the year before I went to um, the class of 2019, I think, they presented their thesis, or no, that was 2020. And um, one of my peers, Maggie Parker, she presented a paper on religious trauma theory in relation to music therapy. And some of her um, work, I thought, I was kind of like, oh, I want to take some of the things that I heard her talk about, but pursue it under a queer lens. So it was actually really nice to have that kind of peer relationship. And I even got to, um, I won't say steal, but um, borrow some of her sources um, and being able to read even like a peer's paper. And she was published. So that was also exciting. But so to be able to have her as kind of a base inspiration was kind of cool. Um, I think 
I definitely did a lot of preliminary research because I knew that I wanted to pursue memoirs. I have a, just a personal connection to LGBTQ memoirs. Um, so I was trying to read over the summer before my paper started. And I also wanted to find some more critical theory based sources. So I think I was maybe focused on my lit review over the summer so that I can maybe have a base foundation of knowing more about what I wanted to pursue going into the fall. Cool. So it sounds like you really came in well prepared. Did you feel like your colleagues in your class all came in with great ideas that they were ready to jump on and uh, had done preliminary work or were you kind of an exception there? Well, a really fun thing about the religious studies program is there was three of us. So we were really tight knit. And so of course um, we met a few times over the summer. And I think that maybe I was the one at first with the like maybe the most passionate about one topic, but then through talking with each other, I think that um, one of my peers started to really develop something before we went into the autumn. But no, definitely one of my peers, I think, you know, we were a month or two in before she really knew what she wanted to write about, um, which was fine for the context of that class. Yeah. I think some other programs that might not have been as uh, flexible. Yeah, so some of the, um, some people come in really well-versed on what they're about to do and others, they discover their topic early on and there's pluses and minuses to both, it sounds like. So um, final person I wanted to check in with is Caitlin, who is representing History Senior Seminar. I know you all have to get started in the spring, a semester before you get started with your senior seminar. So tell us uh, about how you came to your topic and what you did over the summer to prepare. Yeah. History majors definitely start earlier and there's a perfectly valid reason for that because you work with a lot of primary documentation and that requires a lot of collaboration to try and, it, and just depending on your topic, you may be trying to get sources from across the world sometimes. And so really having the time to kind of flesh out your ideas and see what's available is really important important. So for me, in terms of finding my topic, I knew that I wanted my senior seminar to serve me in the process of really solidifying what I wanted to do post-grad. I had an idea that I wanted to go into education, but I wanted to definitely do something that was going to be helpful in terms of doing that. And so I had an initial interest last spring in thinking about how history becomes curriculum, what kinds of messages get passed on as factual information. And so in thinking about that, which is like a really big topic, um, it kind of led me to some unanswered questions that I had about property taxes, education finance, and even my own education in Richmond County, Georgia. And so after doing lots of Google searches, I kind of came across some really notable figures that I had been familiar with, but wasn't kind of sure who they were. One of, um, one of them being Lucy Craft Laney, who is a famous black woman educator um, from Augusta, Georgia. And so even from there, I needed to narrow down some more. And I kind of came across a tiny phrase that made mention of the first black public high school in the state of Georgia that I mentioned earlier, which is Ware High School. And I had no idea that it was in Augusta. So that personal connection didn't necessarily come immediately. And so, I mean, it was located on like two streets away from where I went to high school. And that really just blew my mind. And so I had no, you know, I had no idea if anybody else knew that such a monumental accomplishment came out of Augusta. I think generally people tend to know that Morehouse College started in Augusta, but not necessarily the first black public high school. Um, and so that gave me, you know, the incentive to learn as much as I could about the school and its students and the next thing you know, I was I was all in and trying to combine some of those ideas about, you know, property taxes being, you know, how we kind of fund schools, at least in part, and figuring out well, what happened to where high school and how do those two ideas kind of come together. It was very, it was a very complex thing to really navigate through, but I was really thrilled just to kind of follow a process of, of inquiry into finding my topic. Cool. Well, um, I do have a follow-up question for all of you. Um, how did the creation of this research question differ from the other kinds of papers you've done? So for senior seminar, how did coming up with a research topic and a research question differ than how you would have done it in the past? What kind of advice do you have for the current students? Um, and I can let you guys kind of do this popcorn style. Who wants to start? Aaron, go right ahead. 
Um, I would say it was pretty similar to previous works, but just because the senior sim takes place over a longer stretch of time than most research projects that you undertake in most classes prior to that. Um, it was really helpful for me. I did not ever refer to my research question as my research question. It was always my working research question or my draft research question. Um, and it remained a draft up until December 7th at 4.59 p.m. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, that was probably the biggest shift in mindset that helped me. That's great. Who else would like to respond? I think I'll hop on that train just to say that mine was completely different, the process. Usually, you know, developing a research question kind of stems from re-examining course material. And for like smaller historical research projects, you can, you have a little wiggle room in picking what topic you want, but it needs to be within the umbrella subject of the class and the objectives of the course. And so the senior seminar course, I could do anything I wanted. And so doing that, I think it, the process for me became really organic, as I was talking about earlier, just following a process of inquiry and finding out the things that I was interesting, interested in. And that, that whole process, just starting out that way for me, made the whole thing vastly different from everything that I was really used to. And so I found myself, you know, asking a lot of why questions. And, but I think, you know, the, the best thing that Aaron said that I would just like to reiterate is really, you know, a draft, a research question. You kind of think you know things and then you really don't and you really want to leave that process open so you can engage with it as long as you can. And it's a project that you work on for a really long time. Like I think in total I worked on it for 10 months. So you want to make sure that when you are investigating your research questioning and your topic it's something that you're passionate and committed and feel really engaged in. Perfect. Anybody else that wants to chime in here? Yeah, I would say for IR, our timeline is much different. We don't start in the spring and our senior seminar, cl seminar class is a bit different where we have course content and then our seminar paper. Um, and so for us, it felt like really that writing process was really maybe like a month and a half, um, which is a really squished amount of time. So for our discipline specifically, I think it's a bit different. And that's maybe why it's more similar to other research papers because that timeline is going to be closer. Um, but I think there's, with your senior seminar, there's a, a, a much greater emphasis on it has to really be original research, which can be really stressful, because you will be sitting there and you will read dozens of articles, but there's that little thought in the back of your brain saying, well, what if someone's already done this and I just haven't seen it yet? Um, and so I think for me, that was maybe one of the most different parts of like, just has someone done this before already and I just haven't found it yet. Um, and I think part of the way you address that is just by reading a bunch, but also knowing that you can only know about the things that you can find. So if there is something out there, but you can't find it, that's not your fault. Um, if you've done your due diligence, you've had your appointments with Casey and Chris and, you know, spend your life on um, Galileo. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I think that was the biggest difference for me. Just that feeling of, ah, has someone done it before? Um, just being able to let that go a bit. Yeah, so um, there's the feeling of needing to be original, the uh, freedom of feeling like you can just do an organic process. Um, Leah and uh, Lydia, do you guys have any additional things you wanna add? Yeah, one thing I wanted to say was, I think for me, the the research question process was so different because I think it was so clearly like defined, like you have to do it. Like in my head, I was like, you have to think of a research question. You've got to write it down. I went to Amaris, who's on this call to get my research question, you know, tutored by, I mean, we spent like an hour <laughs> on a research question. And I don't think I had ever done that before in the past, even if I had written it down. Um, it was definitely still something that was kind of in the back of my head. I kind of kept it to myself. And then I never went to the CWS until I had that thesis statement that would answer the question. I had never really taken the time to write, you know, write down my research question, get it tutored, talk with a bunch of other people about it. And I think that is super important when you're writing a, a senior seminar, going back to Caitlin's point about, you need to write about something that you're passionate about, right? And so getting many ideas from, you know, different folks who you've kind of thrown your research question at helps you, you know, kind of poke a little bit at, is this something that you're actually interested in? Are you giving this, the, you know, this research question enough diligence? Are you asking the right questions in the right way? Um, because sometimes we, we think you're asking the right question, but it's actually a different question that you want answered. And, and especially for a project that's so long, um, 
you need to make sure that you get it answered. So that clearly for me, it was very much like defining, like you've got to set a research question. If you've got to get a tutor, you've got to give yourself time just to do that. Perfect. And Lydia, did you have anything you wanted to share? Honestly, I feel like they got it. I really agree with Leah about, um, I think maybe in the past, if I wasn't like obsessed with my thesis statement, but I've, you know, written a good few pages, I only have, you know, six to 12 pages to write. So I'll be like, oh, whatever. I'll just write this paper. But with this, when I was unhappy with something, I'd be like, okay, well, we're throwing five pages out. We're changing because I do agree with Leah. Like you have to really care about what you're saying. You have to really be able to like, feel that passion. But yeah, I, I agree with everyone. Perfect. Well, thanks. Um, Chris, you have a few questions. So I think you all have in some ways spoken to this, but thinking about kind of your mental state in the beginning of this process, can you speak to any hurdles that you dealt with as far as procrastination, uncertainty, um, something else that comes to mind is, and, and I'm pretty sure you all are probably familiar with this term, but imposter syndrome was, how did you kind of deal with those things in the beginning? And um, let's go ahead and if anyone wants to respond first, we can kind of go through like we did with, uh, with the last set. I can um, start, especially about the imposter syndrome. That was what one of the things I had in my mind for this question. Um, like Gwen said, it's there's so much pressure to write something that's original, you know, something that's like gonna change the field. I mean, this is kind of the things that was going in my head, guys. And so like my biggest hurdle was like, okay, do I have like the tools and like the academic voice to even do something like that? And, you know, it took me, and I'm, I actually still am asking myself these questions. And so even after the thesis is done and trying to like figure out where to kind of send it and things like that. And so I think for me, the biggest hurdle was trying to hype myself up to say, okay, Leah, you've got this, you've got the agency, you've got the tools, you've got the resources to kind of create this original body of work. And it's okay to be scared and to feel like you might not have the tools, but you do have them. And so kind of go ahead and like, kick yourself out the door and do it. Um, so for me, that was the biggest hurdle because for a couple of weeks I was like, I don't know about this guys. Um, so yeah. Uh, Lydia, Lydia just raised her hand, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Leah. Just to go off of what Leah was saying, I felt really lucky to be working with Tina Pippen um, who is kind of in charge of our little cohort. But so Tina would consistently tell us like, you are the expert on this topic. And something that she would say to us that I think really did help me with imposter syndrome is she would say like, when you're done with this paper, you can enter any room in America and you will be the person who knows the most on your topic. And at first you're like, are you sure? Like, what if I meet the one person who read, who read, who wrote that like one book I really liked, but um, I really do think that I could enter any room and be the most knowledgeable person on this topic. And she would use these really uplifting terms that I started to use on myself. Like, oh yeah, I'm an expert on this now. And even like, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a young scholar. I am, I'm an academic and just all these other things. It's kind of almost like affirmations, but they would really work. And so, um, and I think that I just entered it thinking that I had writing anxiety and honestly thinking that like, oh, I'm not that great of a writer. This will be so hard and leaving being like, I'm an expert within my field um, and I did get published. And so now I have this like super confidence because I am an expert. And so I think that um, maybe undergrads, we don't uplift ourselves as much as we should as academics, but we really are. And we deserve the confidence because we're putting in the work. I mean, if you're writing a thesis paper, you're an expert. So I think uh, for me, it was, Really, uh, self-love somehow helped. Would others like to uh, follow that? <laughs> yeah. I think Lydia, wow, Lydia, Leah, wow, wow, wow. Really hitting on some good stuff. Um, I am inclined to agree 100%. I think one thing that really did help me feel like I had something to contribute um, because, well, before I say that, it was a little difficult because there were there was a significant bit of primary source material that was either lost or destroyed or just not made available to me, um, especially you know during the pandemic. Uh, wow, access to resources a huge hurdle. 
Um, but in also trying to be original and making sure that you're contributing something worthwhile, there's also a pressure to feel like you're really, really well read, that you like know everything about a topic before you can really find your niche area. And so I think one of the things that really did help me throughout the process was just sharing all of the things that I was learning with my family. I mean, my parents aren't from Augusta, Georgia, but all of my siblings are. And so just talking about, hey, these are the things that the people who came before us went through just so we could do the things that we do every day. And like taking my family downtown with these like 19 or 1840s like Sanborn fire insurance maps and going downtown in Augusta and like pointing out all of these different places where these buildings used to be was a really awesome way for me to kind of process the information that I was talking about but it also you know when my mom would ask me questions about the things that I've learned and what I knew I had information to answer them I think that was it was a very empowering experience to be able to share that kind of information with the black community in Augusta because we kind of have a tendency to bury um, the progress here, but wait, that's a conversation for another time. But I think definitely battling the imposter syndrome is a huge thing, um, but sharing your information, just talking with your friends or with your family about what you're learning makes you feel extra knowledgeable for sure. Did you, Erin and Gwen, did you all share with others? Did you feel like, was that helpful in getting you started and maybe overcoming some of that uncertainty? And that could be peers or like Caitlin was saying, family. Did you all kind of talk through things? I think one thing that helped me pick my topic and feel good about it was the fact that my professor said this would be a good senior seminar topic. Like I probably wouldn't have really thought about that until my professor said that. And so, I mean, that's something that's hard for you to do because it's depending on someone else, but starting to talk about these things with your major advisor um, earlier on, kind of like what kinds of things that, that I'm doing already might be good. Um, but I think talking to other people really helped me figure out like before I knew figure out what I was doing because when you're I don't know Aaron had this problem of when you're creating another theoretical framework it's really hard to do to differentiate it from other things so that was something that was really helpful just like I sat down in the kitchen my mom was making dinner and I was just explaining to her why these things were different and if I didn't know I'd write it down um but I think I like those affirmations Lydia that you were talking about I think that would have really helped me in my process um Cause like once you do it you're like wow yes i did that and actually last month this is kind of weird but last month i had a dream that i met the person who founded the movement that i wrote about and i told her about my senior sem and she was like yes i agree and i woke up and i was like oh my God. i mean it wasn't real obviously but i was like oh that's so cute so i think once you get over there you have that feeling but you don't necessarily feel like when you're in it so i like that idea of affirmation because i think that would have helped that's a definite affirmation. That is, yes, you are, you got the okay. <laughs> Aaron, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I found myself throughout the course of the semester um, thinking very often about the uh, Audre Lorde quote, our feelings are our most genuine paths to knowledge um, and taking very seriously, um, not just that I'm an academic, right? Like Lydia said, not just that I'm a scholar, but like my experiences and the things that brought me to the point where I'm interested in writing about a marginalized group, like that matters and that's important. And um, a huge kind of bone that I pick with IR is that they like to obscure their positionality when writing about things that impact people. And that was something that in my paper, I was criticizing IR for. So like halfway through, I'm like, why am I sitting here being, oh, should I, actually acknowledge that I hold this identity I'm like no I I should and I can say that and that doesn't discount me that actually makes me more credible um and so that forced me to become confident I think not just with my academic voice in the sense that I knew that I was technically proficient at writing but that my opinions and my experiences and my perspective that brought me to that point were also just as important um and mattered just as much Thank you. Uh, next question. So, and if maybe, if everybody could just kind of focus in on one thing, because I think this is where we could probably spend like an hour discussing, um, but which area of your research did you find to be the most challenging? Where were you, the, the problem you ran into and you're like, ooh, this is gonna be hard. I know for some of you, I, I know what it is, but you tell us, um, and Caitlin, I'll just, because I, I think I have an idea of what yours was, and you've kind of spoken about before, but if, if you want to, and then we'll just go around. 
Well, Chris, I think you do know. We've Chris and I became best buds. We've had many a conversation about this. I think the biggest challenge that I faced is one that I so often criticize other authors for, and that's centering marginalized voices. So I really struggled with trying to balance the writing. So I was looking at where high school and the reason it closed was because an all white, you know, board of education shut it down. And they said it was for economic reasons, which we know is a very loaded thing to say. And so I really struggled with trying to figure out, okay, how do I discuss the implications of human capital theory and the impacts of this Supreme Court case and 19th century white supremacists in the halls of government without losing or undermining the agency of the black community in Augusta. And with such a significant loss of primary source material that would really help, that would have helped me generate a very comprehensive narrative of the emerging, you know, black industrial and black professional classes. How do I really and fully describe the black agenda for public education and convey the significance that was where high school, even though it was shut down. And if I don't get that balance right, what does that say about me as a black author from Augusta, Georgia? And I think even now, you know, three months after I have submitted the paper, I'm not sure that I got that balance just right. But I think that's a part of the process. I think historical writers definitely struggle with, you know, the balance between summary and analysis and how much context do you really need to know in order to understand what it is that I'm talking about and how do I talk about the, the implications without, you know, burying anybody's agency in those situations? But I think, you know, again, that's a part of the process. And hopefully I'll continue to grow in that as a writer and as I continue researching and contributing to the field. You Would anyone else like to talk about this point? Your biggest hurdle. Did you, are you raising your hand, Leah, or are you like, no? Yeah, no, no. Oh, okay. okay. My biggest hurdle was actually um, our literature review. Um, that is kind of a mandatory section of really any large paper. So I'm, I'm, I know Katie had it as well. Um, for, I just had never written a um, literature review before entering my IR class, specifically this big final literature review. So it was kind of like, whoa, I'm feeling a little underprepared. Um, and so I remember uh, working on it three to four weeks in advance of when the deadline was due and even like getting it done before the deadline to send it to my professor. He sent it to Chris, sent it back, edit again, turn it in, re-edit. Like it was just this continuous process. And the reason as to why it was so difficult for me was because, you know, I think we're normally, when, especially, specifically when we're talking about integrating sources, we're normally accustomed to like integrating one specific source, one specific article, you know, fully explaining it and then kind of then doing the analyzing, right? Versus within a literature review, you're taking five different authors who have the same argument and wrapping it into one sentence. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, interesting. And so it was super hard for me to decide, like, how do I properly represent these authors and their information in one to two sentences while also not discrediting the work that they have did, you know, that that's actually like 50 pages into two sentences. Um, and so for me, that was the most difficult. And the really the way I overcame it was taking that time before the deadline, three to four weeks <laughs> to plan it out. And there were many a draft many a draft, many of just like throwing the page away and starting all over again, because I thought that I had taken too long to talk about someone's argument as well. So planning time management is super, super important. And I know we'll talk about that more um, later in the in the panel. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Aaron, Gwen, Lydia, do you all want to speak to your, your uh, most challenging part of the research? I think for me, yeah. some of the research was really personal which is good because I am intentionally taking on something where my lived experience matters. But I think that sometimes I had to give myself a little bit of space or a little bit of time where I normally don't have to. It kind of depends. I do think IR and religious studies can be very vulnerable spaces frequently. You're reading about some really heavy topics a lot of the time. Obviously, same with history. Um, maybe just the humanities. But so... I think um, knowing, or like, I read a lot of um, ex-gay people's work and knowing how to put that into my paper without uplifting them 
was kind of tough. And then also reading their work at all <laughs> was really challenging, but I'm really glad I did it. Um, and I'm glad that I also carved spaces for kind of basically self-care. Like I would read and then I'd be like, okay, now I will do a face mask. But so, um, it, yeah, the topic was sometimes tough. And Gwen, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I was gonna just second the literature review thing because I had also never done that before. We, we got to senior sem and I did not plan those three to four weeks ahead. So that was tough, would recommend what Leah did. Um, as well as when, I mean, in mine, I developed my own theoretical framework as well, which was so grueling to go through um, because normally people take a theory that already exists and a bunch of like experts have already written on and then they apply it to something. And so if you do wanna do something like that, you really have to set aside extra time to figure out how you're gonna look at things and what that means and then actually look at the things. Um, so that was something that was definitely tough. And Erin, did you wanna add anything? Um, I would second pretty much what everyone else has already said um, and just add that, I mean, in an entirely remote pandemic, it can be like access to sources. Um, and that's something that's kind of difficult to get around. But um, I am grateful to the library, Casey in particular, for helping me through that as much as she could. But some things are just kind of unavoidable and it can be difficult. Great, thank you. Well, that's a good segue. Um, I was gonna say, first off, we're about to um, change up how we're doing the questioning. I'm just gonna ask, uh, each of us are going to ask a particular person a question and others are uh, able if they agree or disagree with something that somebody said to go ahead and chime in. Um, but just for time's sake, we're going to focus in on asking specific people questions. And I'd like to ask Erin. Um, Erin and I worked together throughout the semester on her on their project. Um, and I uh, wanted to know, who did you go to advice for advice outside of me <laughs> and assistance as you progress through your research? So I know that we work together significantly, but, um, and the librarians are here for everyone, but who else did you go to? Yeah, um, besides the librarians, I had a CWS partner. Um, we met once a week for an hour consistently. Shout out to Elizabeth Dudley. She got me through that. Um, so that was a huge part. I highly recommend that. Um, that was my first semester getting a partner tutor. And I was really just like, this is for senior sim. I can handle the rest of my coursework. This is for senior sim. Um, and so that was um, really, really helpful. And then I went to a lot of faculty members, particularly WGSS faculty, because I was taking on an interdisciplinary project. So I'd go to Dr. Morris and I'd be like, what do we have on this topic? And then I'd turn around and I'd like enter the next Zoom and I'd be like, so Dr. Whitworth, I know you don't do IR. I know you don't do trans studies, but what you got for me? And they would send me an email with like 12 sources. Um, so I am always, always draw, you know, your professors have, have, have doctoral degrees. So they do know how to do research very well. Um, and most of the time they're willing to help you out, so. That's great. Any responses? Yeah, just quickly, I definitely reaching out to your faculty advisors. For the history senior sim, you are assigned a librarian mentor as well as a faculty mentor whose research is, you know, in the department that's close to yours. So I had Chris as my advisor, I had Dr. Kane as my advisor, I also had Dr. Robin Morris as my advisor as well. And so meeting with them, I had multiple meetings with all of them, like multiple times a week to really kind of talk through my ideas and using them as a sounding board as well as just getting resources. And it was really helpful for me as well. As a follow-up question, I just want to know, um, was there a point in time when you stopped asking as much? Um, like, is it more front-loaded? Uh, when do you kind of transition into, how does that transition over the course of time? Erin, do you mind um, kind of following yeah. up with that? Mine was definitely front-loaded, um, where I, I developed a really detailed outline. And so once I had that outline by like, probably late September, mid-October, somewhere in there. Um, I knew what sources I needed. And once I had those, um, it came down to me. Uh, and that was the hard part. But yeah, at that point, at least I got out of office hours every every day, so. 
That's great. Did anybody else have something different, a different process, or feel like you had to talk to, what, what about the latter part? Was um, there anything that happened that towards the end that you needed help with and you went to people for help with? Um, one thing that I'll say in addition to is that I um, was extremely blessed to be able to do work on the Caribbean while being in the Caribbean. And so for me, I then was able, and having been born in the Caribbean, I had some points of contact that I could reach out to outside of Agnes to kind of give me feedback on my paper. And so, as I told you, my research question was really focused on like, whether or not public health solutions were better than punitive solutions to uh, reducing gun violence, to, spoiler alert, they are. And um, I ended up reaching out and having the opportunity to chat with the police commissioner here in the Virgin Islands about my work. Um, and also then also being able to reach out to and have a chat multiple times with a former Senator who actually um, attempted to and did pass a bill that was specifically focused on viewing gun violence in the territory through a public health lens. So I was really, really able to not only get kind of like Agnes Scott feedback review, but also to have conversations with people on the ground who would be in theory, kind of like the people who push this change forward. Okay. Well, just to kind of summarize for all of our listeners out there, there are a lot of um, support services for getting um, help on developing out your idea or um, uh, looking for sources, trying to come up with your research question, um, looking at your outline, um, reading drafts, those sorts of things. The Center for Writing and Speaking has resources, the library, Chris and I, Liz Bagley, um, we're happy to meet with you one-on-one -on -one, and many people schedule appointments with us uh, on an ongoing basis. But it really is up to the individuals who are working through their senior seminar to identify who they need help from and just ask because there's lots of people willing. So thanks for that response. I wanted to um, now move on to Caitlin and ask her about primary um, and secondary sources. Um, what kind of advice would you give to others who are trying to leverage these different types of sources and how they would be integrating these resources into their work? Thank you, Casey. I do have a lot to say about this particular <laughs> question as a CWS tutor, but um, I think my main piece of advice is that you can only leverage your sources to the extent that you are familiar with them. So it is so important at the beginning of the research process to read your text and really get into it. You know, you want to read for understanding, you know, what the author is saying and all that kind of stuff, but try to have a conversation with the text. For, for me, you know, reading through my primary sources in particular, I love to, to put myself in the room. You know, I'm sitting in, you know, the Georgia Supreme Court and I'm, you know, looking at all of these different people. I went and tried to find portraits of the judges who were there. I gave them accents and everything to try and figure out what was happening. And I think it, that's not entirely necessary, but I think in doing that, when I was reading, it really kind of gave me an opportunity to find more nuance in their arguments rather than just looking at the overarching ideas. And to do that, you have to kind of read more than one time. And I would say be okay with doing that um, because sometimes you may have to read a source once or twice to make sure that you truly understand what's, what's going on. Um, and I do issue that with a disclaimer because like Lydia, the topic can, got really heavy, especially 19th century white supremacy was, it, it was a lot for me. And so when you are planning for that process, definitely, take time to sit with those feelings and acknowledge your positionality and kind of integrate that into your work. Um, and then speaking of positionality, in terms of in integrating sources into your writing, I think this is kind of where we really have to be the most careful. Um, by the time you get to, to this stage in your undergraduate career, you usually have an understanding of your own academic voice. And so thinking about your sources and really having a conversation with them, you wanna make sure that you're not letting your sources secondary or primary do the talking for you. And so remembering that they're always there to help you illustrate the point. And I find that it was most difficult for me to do that with primary sources, especially as I was telling someone else's story, not to let them speak for me, but rather than using their voices to kind of support the analysis that I was making. And so one of the ways that I, I like to do that, since I'm very like practically oriented, is using the soapstone method, which kind of analyzes what the speaker, occasion, audience, purpose, subject, tone, those kinds of things. And I can drop a graphic in the chat if anybody is interested in that. 
Um, but thinking about all of those different elements can really help you to differentiate what the author is saying and your voice and how they're adding to your ideas. And so you want all of these ideas to flow, you know, as seamlessly as possible, but I would just suggest that you have a, a good solid sense of what your academic voice is and you understand what the authors are arguing so that they don't begin to speak for you. Yes, I can drop the graphic in the chat. I see somebody asking for that. Chris, do you have any follow-up questions with that that you'd like to hear from before you ask a few more questions? Um, no, I think for the sake of time, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask when. Uh, so right, we've got to ask, sometimes there's the nuts and bolts stuff that's not glamorous, but has to be done. Um, what did you use as far as tools or resources to manage your citations? What did you find to be the most helpful, Gwen? I had sort of a step-by-step -step process to make sure I didn't lose things, knew what they were saying, and then cited them correctly. So the first step was when I found something I liked, put it in Zotero. Zotero and I became best friends. Doesn't mean I like Zotero, but we were best friends. Um, my Zotero got so full, I felt like a librarian because y'all have crazy <laughs> Zoteros. And I, I remember seeing those and being like, that's, that's wild. I would never have something like that. And I'm sure it isn't like that. Isn't you got librarian level with that Zotero. Okay, that's <laughs> like. <laughs> I did. Yeah, so save it as Zotero, first of all. Second of all, I always had a running Google Doc of quotes that I wanted to keep. And then I would put the citation there of like the name of the author and the year and I would highlight it in green so every time I could scroll through my paper so if I was writing the paper or I just had notes I could see every single time when I was citing someone else that makes it really easy when you're going back or at least my method was I would write the whole paper and then I went back and added on the citations at the very end um so especially that highlighting it means you're not going to miss any citations when you actually go through and do that final thing the last thing I did that I think it was a hack that Casey showed me and it literally changed my life. Google Scholar will make the citation for you. If you look up that article on Google Scholar, it'll, it has like a little, little quote icon. If you click on that, it'll give you the MLA, APA, Chicago, like five different types. And that literally saved me so much time. Um, and it was beautiful. And I was so glad that you showed me that Casey. Um, changed my life. So that was my like three step process for making sure I didn't lose anything and I did it right. Did everybody else find similar to what Gwen's saying, did you have some method that you used to keep track? Because everyone's spoken to the point that you used multiple sources, right? And you're doing this over months. Did anyone else have anything that uh, differed drastically from what Gwen uh, just talked about? So everybody had a method though, right? Everyone had something they used. Very important. Um, and then Lydia, as far as avoiding plagiarism, um, careful note taking, things like that. And uh, Gwen's uh, definitely spoken to this. Was there something that you, did you have any fear of that? Or was there anything that you did differently to kind of keep track and make sure that you were present, that you were paraphrasing and quoting correctly and doing those kind of things properly? Yeah, and I think um, sometimes with plagiarism, we get scared because it sounds like a carceral word. Like, it sounds like, oh, no, I've committed a crime. But I think frequently, you know, these things are accidents. So one of the best things to do is to ask. Sometimes when I wasn't sure if I was paraphrasing effectively or if I wasn't sure about my citations, I would talk to a peer. I would talk to my professor. I'd also talk to you, Chris Bishop. Mm -hmm. um, and... I think, you know, having someone look over your work in the editing process, no one's going to be like upset with you if you do something that's maybe a little too close to plagiarism. Yeah. But unfortunately, once you submit it, the ramifications become real. So I really recommend, you know, in the editing process, definitely have people looking over it. And I think the best way to avoid plagiarism is actually what Gwen was recommending is keeping just a long list of what you're reading the citations. And then I also recommend if you have an idea while you're reading something, even if it's loosely inspired by what you read, make that a footnote, yes. um, which is especially great if you're using like Chicago style. But another like positive about using the footnote is you could like bolster your claim while also giving credit to where it comes from. And even if you realize that you disagree with the reading and that, that gives you an idea, I think you should definitely still cite that reading 
Um, and you can even talk about it in the footnotes. So that's a nice space. And then one last thing is I did uh, a lot of social media. So I think that's something that was maybe a little different about my work that I would recommend for people trying to avoid confusion with plagiarizing social media because it's not the same as like when you're reading a text is I talked with you and we decided on doing a social media appendix. And since I've had some people kind of compliment the social media appendix, I've been like, oh, okay, this is, this is cool in the <laughs> academic circle. But so um, I had screenshots and information about the accounts, dates where I saw the data, things like that, because those pages could be deleted. But also I don't want to cite their their visual work, because that's just as important as written work, and accidentally kind of plagiarize some of their labor. So, you know, there's there's creative solutions to creative problems. I think that's such a good point, because now with social media and other things that are not books, that are not articles, you still want to cite them in some way and present them so that people reading them in the future can see them, but it certainly pre presents a whole lot of uh, difficulties that, you know, someone writing 30 years ago didn't encounter. So you know, it's a whole new set. Uh, Casey, did you want to yeah. ask the next question? So clearly, um, with all the challenges and successes that uh, all of you have experienced, time management is extraordinarily important with your senior seminar. And I'd like to hear from the great Leah Trotman, who has already told us about uh, doing her literature review three weeks in advance before the deadline. What kind of tips do you have for us about time management? Yes, okay. <laughs> so um, for me, I knew that Senior Time was going to be a really big project, just kind of thinking about the scope of my idea in general. Um, and so I think I probably went about a week without having like a set kind of schedule that I could show my CWS partner who was Amaris. Um, and then I said in the next meeting, I was like, Amaris, I can't do this without kind of some kind of set calendar where I have internal deadlines, external deadlines. Um, and so we sat down together, Amaris and I, um, at the beginning of the semester and decided here is when we were going to have internal things do just between us. Here's when we're going to have external things do. I put meetings, potential meetings that I wanted to have with Chris, potential meetings that I wanted to have with Dr. Morris, potential meetings I wanted to have with other like fellow CWS tutors. All of that went into my calendar, not just when things were due. Um, I also had like a reading schedule in there as well as just like a writing time schedule as well. And it was all combined into this one schedule template. Shout out to Caitlin for giving me that template. Um, because it's just such a very long process of writing and researching and it can feel very, very, very overwhelming at times. And so having much more like smaller bite chunks for me was like, I think the best way for me to manage my time, not feel overwhelmed and still get things done. Um, and so I think that that was kind of the overall best part for me. Um, so definitely sign up for a CWS partner definitely create your own writing schedule um, as well. And then also allow yourself a lot of grace because sometimes things pop up and sometimes the reading does not get done or the writing just doesn't get done. There were definitely days when I just was like, I don't have the mental capacity to do this. And so also recognizing that that schedule, your time management is not necessarily set in stone and you can just readjust um, and then come back better the next time. Perfect. And I think the last question we want to ask the panelists, if everyone can go around and tell us what you plan to do with your work. I know some of you are going or have already published or you might be using it for graduate school. Can everyone tell us initially what you've done with that work and what your plans are in the future? And I guess I'll just call. Leah, do you want to go ahead and start first? Yeah, so I have um, so my thesis is 50 plus pages, so I need to figure out how to kind of condense it if I do want it to be published somewhere else. Um, but Chris, you just sent me like two weeks ago um, a format for um, the executive summary because I have eventual goals of being able to send this to um, some of the senators who are currently sitting in the 34th legislature of the Virgin Islands and kind of have and spark some conversations about what future work can get done specific to gun violence. Because like I said at the beginning, the second half of my thesis specifically evaluates two strategies um, that have worked in the United States um, in reducing gun violence in certain parts that mirror the demographics of those that can be found here in the Virgin Islands specifically. Um, and so kind of pushing those two strategies out to former senators is kind of the next step on my list. Very cool. Um, Aaron, do you want to go next? 
Sure. Um, so I do have loose aspirations of getting my work published because it is so interdisciplinary. I'm really in the process of finding a journal that I think um, I could say either that I have a chance of getting into or I could be, you know, a cocky scholar and be like, that is worthy of my work. Either one, however you choose to spin it uh, in the process of kind of hunting for something that I think it would fit in um, because trans IR is a new project. Uh, but also I may not decide that that's, that may not happen. I plan to go to graduate school in geography, uh, which is totally different than both fields that I've come from. And I think that uh, it's really important as you go through this process to remember that even if you don't get published or even if this doesn't become your dissertation one day, um, or even if it doesn't make it into the hands of your nation's legislative body, like that's fine and it's still something to be proud of and you've still done good work. Uh, and for like the just the development of myself as an academic, I'm grateful enough for this project as it is. So yeah. Excellent. Uh, Gwen. Yeah, so I it's sort of tricky because not many people at Agnes do environmental academic stuff. And so I really don't have many of the resources to figure out where I would even publish it. So that's something where like that would be nice, but I really, I have not even started the process of trying to figure out what that would look like. Also because I was creating a new framework. So I don't know, it's just a weird thing to figure out um, like Aaron was talking about. But I think also like Aaron was saying, having that confidence boost of like knowing and like Lydia was saying, like I know the most about this topic and like I'm going into a master's program that's like directly this work that I was doing in my senior STEM. And so being able to say that I've done this work already, um, I think it's just good for myself and in knowing that I can I can do something that's like cool and like interesting and and important. Um, and yeah, and actually I see my first of what I'm gonna do with it, read it again. Full disclosure, I have not read it since I turned it in in December because winter break I was like that was too much time. I'm not looking at it. So my my first step is reading it again and reminding myself of the cool things that I did because I mean, you can put stuff down, but I think something that's important is to go back to it if you think it's going to be important to your work because you can kind of forget the kinds of things you were talking about or the, the nuances of your argument that I, can actually be helpful, especially because I was creating a new framework that I'd like to take into my future um, career and work. So yeah, I guess step one is read it again and then appreciate it for its confidence boost. <laughs> And it'll just magnify itself over time. In a year from now, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I wrote that. That's good. <laughs> uh, Kaylin, what would, what would be your, uh, what are your plans? Well, I kind of know, but. Well, yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> the first step for me um, was to just keep sharing. I think my, my family was, you know, after being forced to listen to me talk about my project for such a long time, they were naturally interested in how everything turned out. Um, and my mom being the proud Southern woman that she is has been talking about it to other people. So definitely just continuing to share um, with people who weren't super familiar with the school. Um, I'm also expanding my research into the 490 senior thesis course. So I really hope to investigate the African-American agenda for education, kind of specifically looking at the power of taxes and private donations and philanthropic donations in the development of schools in Georgia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and looking at what those implications are for today. Uh, I plan to go to, to graduate school and either do education policy and administration or public administration. And so this, this kind of work and this kind of research that I've done in the 420 and that I'm doing now in the 490 is really setting a very good foundation for you know, the work that I'm going to do in those programs and beyond. Um, another really cool fun fact that I found out recently is my alma mater, Davidson Fine Arts Magnet School, um, 
they are reviving a 1999 play for the stage, which was called Where and When, where spelled W-A-R-E, like where high school, um, to commemorate the school during Black History Month. And I thought it was so cool because I got to, you know, when I was doing the research project, I reached out to my principal to see if she had some more resources because she had been working in the system for so long and chatting with some of the contexts that I had at the Board of Education. So it was really cool to kind of see how, you know, in talking about the research process with her, it was something that she felt really strongly about. And she shared with the students at my school, like now they're doing this whole play about it. Like I thought that was the, the craziest, craziest thing and really exciting that, that it's happening. My brother's in the play too. So it was just a really cool, fun circle kind of thing. I'm not sure if the rest of my friends at the, the Richmond County Board of Education would like to hear all of my critiques about the system, but it's available to them if they want, if they want to read it and do something about it. So <laughs> those are kind of my plans for, for my paper. Cool. And Lydia? So I'm very proud to say I will not be going to grad school. I'm very, very happy for all of my peers who will. It's not for me. But so a fun thing about that was I feel like um, this is kind of a lot of where my academic passion is um, oriented because it is the end of it. But so um, I'm very, very excited. I'll be presenting at SEAR in March, which is the Southeastern kind of religious studies conference. They do grad students and undergrads. Um, and I also think I'm really lucky to be in the field of religious studies because I think it's a very, really cool, um, it's way more open-minded than a lot of people think. And so with religious studies, they are really open to a lot of undergrads work. Um, in international relations and political science, it's really harder to get published or to be a presenter at one of these conferences as an undergrad. Um, so I'm really impressed that you guys are pursuing that um, because with my poli sci thesis, Google Docs will probably see the most of it and that'll probably be it. But, um, but yes, I'm really happy to be published because also, um, I shared it with some members of the uh, clergy and that had mixed results. So I'm excited to share with people who will not think it is against their theology, which I think will happen once it's published. It'll be, you know, other academics. So that'll be nice. But sharing it with clergy members was also really um, valuable and a really important experience for me, though I definitely think you don't have to share your paper with the church. <laughs> It's okay if you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think now we want to turn it over and ask um, everyone attending, do you have questions for the panelists? Any questions for upcoming things? Or I think a couple of you are already taking a senior seminar. Can place them in the chat or they can uh, say them out loud. Chat says, you all did a wonderful job. I think you did such a good job of answering all the questions. <laughs> okay, well, if no one has any questions, I guess real quick, I know we're over time, but, but to all the panelists, do you all have any questions for each other? Is there anything that this has brought up that maybe you're kind of wondering that someone else talked about and you're like, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Or I guess any kind of, um, or any advice that you would give anyone, some parting advice. I just want to say that when Leah told me about her strategy of planning ahead and creating those external deadlines for yourself, like saying, oh, like, hey Chris, in two weeks, can you look over my lit review? I did not think of that. And I really wish that I had um, because with IR especially, it's really squished in. If you just go by the deadlines that are given to you, um, it's a lot. Um, which, I mean, it's a lot either way. But when I heard about what Leah was doing, I was like, oh, why didn't I think of that? I should have done that too. So I really highly recommend that because it's really hard to motivate yourself, but creating those external deadlines for yourself with a state of your ass tutor, with your major advisor, with the librarian, I think really helps you um, get motivated to do that because you don't want to let other people down. So, I should say, and I don't want to embarrass Caitlin, but when you see K K 
Thielen's outlines, it's like, wow, you need to publish this. This should be in a book because this is this is some serious prep work. It's like when I'll just say, Caitlin, but what, one of the things I appreciate is, is Caitlin would would give me this outline and it would say, OK, Chris, I need you to look at this, this and this. And I knew others were receiving this similar outline. So it was kind of geared towards the person uh, that she her, her audience and how that person was looking at it. And I was just truly amazed by that. I was like, wow, I've never seen anyone, student, staff, faculty, whatever, come up with, with that detailed outline. But but you knew what Caitlin was looking for. Um, yes. <laughs> I just <laughs> would like to reiterate uh, that writing, Leah and I firmly believe this and we tell students this all the time, writing is a process that you have to plan for, especially with the senior seminar. It's so long, you're working on it. If you're a history major, you really, you start working on it a whole semester in advance. And so trying to keep yourself organized can be really, really difficult. Um, and so whenever I would meet with Chris, this is what he's talking about. I would definitely, I would send a small installment or something and I would say, hey, here you go. This is where it's going in the paper. Do you mind checking, you know, for these things or, you know, so definitely take, take use of all of your advisors and all of the people who are available to help you. Um, another thing that I wanted to say, which I think I'm forgetting my train of thought has been lost. Come back to me. I will remember what I was going to say. You just really had me laughing about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. My only comment was that um, I would love to read everyone's uh, pieces on the call. So please just send them my way. Um, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> well, and really, I mean, the, the five of you and why we reached out is because you all exhibited these strengths in these different areas. So if a student was coming to us and saying, oh, who, not that they probably would, but if they did, and they said, oh, who should we speak to? The five of you would be like, oh, well, this student, I mean, they've got it down. Like, they really understand the process and the thinking and, and how to really make this to personalize it. And so that, you know, made you guys just amazing students. And they also had, they also had different challenges. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. I remember what I was going to say. It was about the process. Y'all were talking about how in IR, you know, you have all these group things and common readings that you do before you actually get started. In history, it's not all like that. Yes, we start early, but everyone's kind of on their different thing. And one thing that Dr. Kane likes to do is set a draft very early on. So you do an installment, but a few weeks after that, you have a full draft of your paper. Usually it's not very good, but that's okay. Um, and it, it just, it feels very crazy because you're like, I have not read enough. I do not know enough to try and create, you know, 15, maybe 20 pages worth of work. And I think in my case, my first draft was well over 40 pages. And I was just, you know, like Dr. Kane, none of this makes any sense. Uh, but yeah, I think again, leaning into your peer advisors, your faculty advisors, your librarian mentors, y'all are so valuable. And I don't think you get thanked enough um, for all of the help and all of the support that you provide to students. But yeah, managing your time, leaning into those resources, I think is going to be the most helpful. And I too would like to read your work if you would like to share them with me. So I see the emails dropping in the chat. I'll drop mine if y'all are interested in reading my work as well. <laughs> Very cool. Any other thoughts or additions? If not, um, I'm going to put in chat, and Casey would know better than I, but um, I believe Casey next week, this should be the recording should be available on the Skill Builder site. Does that sound right? Yes, correct. And I loved everything that was said that I'm probably going to post it in the Irvine. So. Yeah, I think this is, I think it's going to be mandatory uh, viewing for those in the future because you, you all just, uh, your insight and your willingness to share was incredible. Um, so we're going to have that recording that'll be there next week and then uh, Casey will share that in the Irvine and you all, hopefully I'm not misspeaking, but everybody's put their email there so you know, you could always contact these individuals too uh, and get their advice because they are stellar students. Um, anything else uh, anyone wants to add or Casey? No. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much. I think this was great. Thank you panelists. 
And um, we'll see everyone later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.